For many months now, reaching herd immunity has been the ultimate hope and goal for the world, with governments hurriedly aiming to vaccinate their populations against COVID-19. But with the Delta variants tearing through countries more quickly and relentlessly than the original virus strain, infecting and even reinfecting people around the world, governments are reintroducing restrictions and rethinking their pandemic response plans. Vaccination targets are now being questioned, along with the concept of herd immunity itself. Now, to gain some insights on what countries need to do in moving forward, we speak with William Schaffner, the, a medical direct, the medical director of the National Foundation for Infectious Diseases in the United States and a professor of medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases at Vanderbilt University School of Medicine in Tennessee. Very warm welcome to you. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's my great pleasure to be with you. Thank you. And well, we're hearing so many worries, concerns about the Delta variant right now. And it's really got people, a lot of health authorities, even questioning the meaning of herd immunity. And well, recently an Oxford professor, uh, Andrew Pollard, he said that herd immunity is a mythical concept with the Delta variant running loose around the world. What are your thoughts on this? Well, Dr. Pollard is, uh, has a wonderful expression and he is very sophisticated. I think what he's trying to say is that this Delta variant is so very contagious that it's very difficult to conceive of a level of immunity in the population that would reduce the transmission of this virus. Actually, I think I'm a little more optimistic than my colleague, Dr. Pollard, because I actually think that if we could get over to 80%, which is very high, 80%, 85% of people immune, we could really reduce the transmission of this virus. And then it would be easier to live with this virus. It's not going to disappear. We're all going to have to cope with this virus for many years into the future. Now, that seems like something we have to get used to. But the concern is, well, whether future variants of COVID-19, whether they're going to be more transmis uh, transmissible than Delta. And what are your thoughts on this? Well, we're worried about all kinds of variants that may occur in the future. I guess the ones that we're most concerned about are those that evade the protection of our current vaccines. Because if that happened, we would have to create a new vaccine and vaccinate everybody all over again. That would be terrible. That would be a huge, huge task. And of course, the, the Delta virus is about as communicable as it gets. The CDC here in the United States has estimated that it's about as contagious as chickenpox, which is a very contagious virus all by itself. You know, the champion in contagion is measles. This virus is not as contagious as measles, thank goodness, but it is still very, very contagious. And here in the United States, it is seeking out people who are unvaccinated and spreading very quickly among them. And well, a 90-year-old Belgian woman in July, she was found to have contracted two different types of COVID-19 variants at the same time. Now, is this common? Should we be worried about this? Well, <laughs> I hope that 90-year-old lady recovered from her dual COVID infection. As far as we know at the present time, this is very unusual. But of course, in order to determine that, we would have to do whole genome sequencing on many, many more infections. As we do more whole genome sequencing, and we are, we may find more of these infections. At the moment, we think, fortunately, this is a very rare event. And well, if people can be reinfected with other variants, then is herd immunity and an end to the pandemic even achievable? I mean, how often are we also going to need these booster shots that we keep hearing about? Well, when we talk about ending the pandemic, we have to be careful with our use of words because the average person might think that COVID is over. We can forget about it. That's not going to happen. We would like to reduce the pandemic, end the pandemic, but then we'll have to deal with this virus as it lives with us, as the influenza virus does, of course, from year to year. And, you know, with influenza, 
we change the formulation of our vaccine from year to year to match the influenza viruses, we may have to do the same thing or something very similar to COVID. We may have to change from time to time as new variants come up. And well, some are concerned that vaccine-induced immunity wouldn't be as durable as immunity from a natural infection. Is this true? Actually, it's just the opposite. It looks as though vaccine-induced immunity creates much higher levels of antibody than does natural infection. And usually with all vaccines, the more antibody you have, the longer the duration of protection. Also, we know that the more antibody you have, the better able you are to protect yourself against the variants. So they're two good things. Long, high, high amounts of antibody after vaccination result in longer protection and also better protection against the variants. That's why here in the United States, we recommend even if you've recovered from COVID, you should still be vaccinated. Well, the question that many people are asking these days, how long do you think this Delta variant, variant is going to run its course? Well, this Delta variant is at the moment in charge here in the United States. It's causing over 90% of new infections. So it's the dominant virus. It will continue to spread among unvaccinated people. It is so contagious. And if the current, if the current situation uh, continues with not enough people vaccinated, this Delta variant could be with us through the fall and into the winter, constantly infecting more people. And interestingly enough, many older people are already vaccinated. So we can see that this Delta variant is infecting younger adults, now teenagers, and even children. And as you know, in the United States, no vaccine is licensed for children at the moment. So children, could be more seriously infected with Delta as we go into the fall and into the winter. Well, in other countries too, younger, younger people have been relatively uh, behind in terms of the vaccination schedule. And here in South Korea, um, they are set to start getting vaccinated um, later this month, the under 50s group. But as, we, uh, as young people uh, prepare to get vaccinated, there have been uh, some worrying cases of young people experiencing heart problems after being vaccinated. Are they more susceptible to these kinds of side effects? Yes, it does indeed look as though young people, once they're vaccinated, get this inflammation of the heart and the membranes surrounding the heart, myocarditis and pericarditis. Fortunately, most of those cases are rather mild. They recover, and as far as we can tell at the present time, they seem to recover completely. Now, we also have to recognize that the COVID virus can cause the same illnesses and does so even more frequently. But I will grant you that for some parents, it is making them very uneasy and reluctant to vaccinate their teenagers. Because here in the United States, we can now vaccinate all children 12 and older. Some are being vaccinated, but still not very many. And I think many parents are concerned about this heart inflammation. Even though it's rare, a few cases for every million doses administered. Nonetheless, it does worry parents, and I understand why that is. Well, the seasonal flu is always uh, an issue to worry about. And well, this year, it seems that a bigger flu season than normal is expected. And um, scientists like yourself have been warning that respiratory viruses will make a comeback this year after having uh, briefly disappeared last year during the lockdown. There are concerns so, um, regarding this. I mean, should people have, uh, who have got vaccinated against COVID-19 still get the flu shot? Well, the short answer is absolutely yes. They're both very nasty viruses. They can both produce very serious disease, putting people into the hospital. They affect the same populations 
very seriously. Older people, people with underlying illnesses such as diabetes, heart disease, lung disease, and the like. So they're both very serious. So once again, we will be promoting influenza vaccination in about a month or six weeks as we get to the beginning of our influenza season. You know, last year, everybody stayed at home. The children didn't go to school. And so we had very little influenza. This year in our country, people are out. They're meeting again. The children are going to school. People are going to business. They're going to recreational activities. They're worshiping together in congregations. So they're close together. And so we anticipate this year will be a much more normal influenza season. And we need to protect people against the severe disease that influenza also can cause. There are two different viruses, two different vaccines. They don't protect against each other. So we will have to vaccinate against both. Well, until now, most of the focus of national COVID-19 response plans, they've been on uh, inoculating the general population. And while it is, of course, very important to roll out these vaccinations, it's perhaps just as critical to develop effective treatments that are going to cure people who have inevitably fallen sick with the virus. What are hospitals mostly using at the moment and what kind of developments are you hoping to see? Well, actually, treatment of sick people has changed remarkably over the last year, as we have learned so much more about what this virus can do. And so with good intensive care treatment, people are now able to, if they have to go into intensive care units, come out again and can leave the hospital doing well. So the great support of care that we've been able to provide is very important. We've also had some medications. We've learned that remdesivir, which is a drug that reduces the, uh, the viral load, and dexamethasone, which tampens down the inflammatory response, are both very useful. And in addition, we are now using monoclonal antibodies. These are drugs when you have a new infection with COVID and you are in a high risk group, you're asked to come in, you're given these monoclonal antibodies that will prevent your developing more severe disease. We have such a clinic at our institution. There are many other clinics like this, and we think we have prevented much serious disease. Right. Now, all that said, we need even better treatments, and we hope some more of them will come along because this is a very, this COVID virus is a very nasty virus. We need all the help we can get to still treat many sick people. Definitely, definitely. And well, before we uh, end the interview here, well, you must have heard quite a lot of strange theories and fake news about COVID-19 vaccines and the um, pandemic itself. What were some of the, um, what were some that you found the most amusing or even alarming? Well, some of the things that were very disturbing is that people really thought that the government or others were putting chips, microchips, into the vaccine and so injecting them into people. There were others who thought, strangely enough, that people who were vaccinated became magnets and metal would attach to their bodies and not be able to be pulled off. Well, of course, both of those things are incorrect. And well, how would you hope, how do you hope to see um, authorities, public health authorities or social media really deal with these kinds of issues as we go forward? Because it's been quite clear that this isn't just a, a medical pandemic, but one of uh, fake news and all these conspiracy theories as well. Oh, I'm so glad you've mentioned that because you're so correct. There have been so many false rumors out there we can just try to ask each individual who's not been vaccinated, what is your concern? Respect those people and try to respond to their concern, first with facts that go to their brain, but then 
try to make them comfortable, try to reassure them that getting the vaccine is good for them, their families, and their entire communities. We have to reach their heart to make them feel comfortable that this is an appropriate thing to do. We have to do this one person at a time. It's uh, much more difficult than I would have anticipated, frankly. Oh, so, well, it's a mass message, but really um, getting it across personally, that should really help in moving forward, hopefully. Well, this is where we must end the discussion today, but that was William Schaffner, the Medical Director of the National Foundation for Infectious Diseases in the United States and a Professor of Medicine of Infectious Diseases at Vanderbilt University School of Medicine. Thank you again so much for your time. It's an honor, it was an honor to have you on our show. It's my great pleasure. Thank you. And to our viewers, thank you for watching.